and thank you very much for being here this morning and for attending the Humanities Symposium 2017 in the theme of silence. Uh, allow me to say first and foremost on behalf of the auditorium's uh, members here, no food or drink please in the auditorium and of course with uh, having all respect for our presenter today, Rebecca Thomas, please move away from the antisocial devices for a moment which are terribly social in the right time and place and uh, well I don't think you're actually going to have much of a problem uh, tuning in on Rebecca Thomas this morning. But foremost I'd like to welcome everybody, welcome uh, the members of the symposium committee and again all of you. My name is Jeff Sims, the coordinator of this year's Humanities Symposium and I'd like to take a very brief moment to thank this year's symposium committee who are mainly sitting off to my right here, once again for creating a fantastic roster and a fantastic program for what has been a truly very interesting week, if I may say. Uh, Stephanie Belmer, Lily Petrovic, Lisa Jorgensen, Stephen Byron, Kim Matthews, Savek Manjikian, and Sheila Das, and just in general, so to speak, uh, members of the humanities uh, faculty, the uh, humanities department, all for their support. Uh, for this uh, week-long project that we hold every year. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mariah Grant from the Indigenous, uh, sorry, the Vanier Indigenous Circle for her assistance with this project and for helping us sort of get uh, Rebecca Thomas to the stage and uh, here today. Because of the idea initiated by Lily Petrovic in two 2012, the Humanities Symposium is now in its sixth year of existence. And throughout these years, we have seen many exceptional speakers and many exceptional presentations on the stage of events. And so indulge me for one more second and allow me to thank just a few others. Thanks to our Dean, Eric Lozoev, and his office for continued support of the Symposia project. To Darren Becker and Marguerite Corvaux in the Communications Division of the College, whose work is essential for getting the word out. Mike DeMol, who publishes our posters and programs every year at what is always a very hectic time of the year for the people in the print shop. Thank you, Mike, and David Sp Spadato for a really wonderful poster and image this year. I'd also like to thank David Scott and Sasha Wiegens, who have been working hard in accommodating the needs of our presenters, that is to say, the auditorium technicians, uh, as well as the symposia in general. Thanks goes out to you two for the very hard work and the excellent work you do throughout the years and uh, throughout this week. When I considered who might introduce Rebecca Thomas to this year's symposium, it became apparent to me, it came to my attention that one of our teachers, one of the Vanier teachers that is, Nirmala Baines in anthropology, uh, teaches Rebecca's thoughts and ideas in her own anthropology classrooms. So allow me then to turn this over to Nirmala Baines, who has graciously accepted our request that she introduce this year's keynote speaker for the Humanities Symposium, as well as offer uh, a land acknowledgement to the indigenous peoples. Uh, Nirmala, go ahead. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks Jeff. I'm gonna stand up here so everyone can see me. Um, okay, quick. Uh, thought Jeff asked you to all put away your cell phones and don't use them. I was standing there. I could see some people using them. I just want to highlight why he said that and why I'm reminding you. Rebecca Thomas is a big deal. Whether you're aware of it or not, this talk could change the way you see and understand the world around you. All right? So everybody, I just want to acknowledge that today is a very special day, even if you're not aware of it. Okay? But before I can actually really announce Rebecca, I need, we do need to acknowledge the land that we occupy right now, so I, need to, I would like to read um, a statement from Vanier College. It's, Vanier College would like to acknowledge that Vanier is situated on the traditional territory of Ga Nienga Hage, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. Vanier recognizes and respects Ga Nienga Hage as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today. So, as you can see, I, uh, maybe you've never even heard that word before. As you can see, I'm not even that schooled at um, pronouncing it. And so I want to take this moment just for us to uh, maybe consider and think about um, why we know what we know. Okay, so as Rebecca uh, is going to give her presentation, I want you to think about that. Why do we know what we know? Um, and also, I want to just 
uh, speak to that to say that um, omission is one of the most sophisticated forms of censorship. All right? So now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Rebecca Thomas. Um, and one thing I would like to say about her is that she is the Poet Laureate of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Does anyone know where Nova Scotia is? Right? It's a province in Canada? All right. Big, big, huge round of applause for Rebecca. All right. Hey, look, you can hear me. Fantastic. It's my... They don't make these things tall enough. I don't think they think women are this tall. So, big deal. It's exciting. That's a lot to live up to. Um, so my name is Rebecca Thomas. I am Mi'kmaq First Nation from Mi'kmaq. Um, my, you know, Ninda Lewisin, uh, Rebecca uh, Deleo in Mi'kmaq. Um, you know, uh, I'm an indigenous person living in Canada, I think. You know, the braids and the leather does a really good job of, of portraying that. Um, but one of the things, ooh, I don't want to pop my peas too much. One of the things that doesn't always necessarily get acknowledged is like kind of like the vast difference or the fact that we as an indigenous peoples here in Canada have never, ever, ever been in control of our own image, ever. So I always like to start, this is one of my favorite, favorite quotes, and I always like to pitch it to the audience to say, who wants to explain what this means to me? The Indian began as the white man's mistake and became a white man's fantasy. Any brave souls? Hmm? All right, I'll give you, I'll spoon feed it to it first. Christopher Columbus, where was he going when he ran into North America? India, right? Hence, we were being called Indians, right? It was a mistake. Oops. I thought I was in India. You're brown, and I know they're brown, so you must be Indians, right? And then we became a fantasy. Does anybody want to tackle what that means? Pocahontas, Pocahontas exactly, right? Um, the noble savage, what else? Crazy horse, leathers and feathers, you know, this, this notion that we are, I like to, to joke that we are the elves from the Lord of the Rings. These mythical storybook creatures entombed with the earth and can speak to animals and have this magical essence about us, right? This fantasy. And that is what persists, right? That's, you know, when you think of, when you close your eyes and you think of an indigenous person or an Indian, quote unquote, you think of teepees and you think of headdresses and you think of, you know, those characters, Sacagawea, Pocahontas, and even those were historical figures, the way they get co-opted in media, like Pocahontas, the Disney movie, none of that actually happened. Did you know that? The entire Disney movie, the whole thing was a lie. She was a kid when she met John Smith. They never had a romantic relationship. He made up the, the story that she saved him because she was gaining um, prominence in Europe and he wanted to be linked to that. And that she died when she was 21 in England when she was trying to get back to her community. And her name wasn't even Pocahontas. That was her nickname. And that her community believed that if you knew her real name, that the settlers would have power over her. So they never said what her real name was, right? Again, but all of you think the Disney narrative is what happened. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we as an indigenous people have never really been in control of how we are presented. I have to give Jeff props for my, for my title. I actually really like it, 1490 who? Because that's when um, Christopher Columbus came to North America. But not even North America, really far down south. It was John Cabot uh, and Samuel de Champlain who was more up in this region. And I have a great poem about that, but that's not the one that I'm gonna start with. So, shall we continue? I'm gonna give you a little background information first before I go in because it's really important to understand the, con the context and the complexity of indigenous people. How many here think all indigenous people were here at the same time before um, colonization? How many people think we came over in different migrational waves? Hey, good for you. Do you know how we know this? You guys are afraid of me. You're afraid to ask questions. Artifacts? Close. Clo closer. How would you know about migration flows? Not quite. Language. 
So as languages develop and shift and change, if there's a rooted language and people migrate, and those languages will eventually become unique languages. So if you think of um, European languages of Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, they all kind of sound similar, right? They're all rooted in a similar base language, and as those people changed and migrated, those languages became distinct. And so you see that here with indigenous languages. So I'm Mi'kmaq, First Nations. Our language group is the Algonquin language group, one of the biggest ones here, the huge one here. Right? So we know, based on carbon dating of artifacts, that the Mi'kmaq people have been in Canada for at least 12,000 years. And as you see, languages diverge. So Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, all of those are indigenous Algonquin-based languages. You can tell that they have a similar root, right? The, the way they're structured, the way they're spoken. Now, when you have language communities that are right next to each other with no overlap whatsoever, you know that those languages came thousands of years apart. So the languages here are the Iroquois-based languages of Mohawk, Mohican, Oneida. And even though we are neighbors, the Mi'kmaq and the Mohawk, we have zero language overlap. So it's really cool. And the major waves that came over, 12,000 years, 7,000 years, and two to 3,000 years apart, right? So that's kind of the flow of indigenous people into Canada. And the going theory is that they came across the Bering Strait right up here. In terminology, I promise I'm gonna be a lot more entertaining as I go, but it's important that you have a context and understanding. Terminology, how many people here don't know always what word to say or how to refer to indigenous people? Is it First Nations? Is it Aboriginal? Is it indigenous? What do I say? What do those mean? And so this is just a little bit of a context in the background. So indigenous and Aboriginal are catch-alls. They mean all indigenous people here in Canada. And underneath that are First Nations, Métis, Inuit. Inuk is the singular version of Inuit. And non-status. Non-status is a political designation. So First Nations, when you think status cards, when you think of people who look like me, that is First Nations. We have treaties. We are under the Indian Act. All of those sorts of things. Métis, as I understand it, there's historical Métis that came from the Plains region, Louis Riel, the Red River Uprising, but now you're seeing Métis of mixed heritage individuals coming up and popping up all over Canada. And this is a very debated and contentious topic because I'm not the identity police, but some people feel that they might be. And so Métis becomes a really interesting designation, especially with the Daniels decision that now places Métis people in non-status underneath federal jurisdiction. Very complicated stuff. And then finally you have Inuk and Inuit. So Inuk and Inuit people are the north, right? Northern, you, so the word previously would be Eskimo and that's not, a, that's not a good word to use anymore. So you'd wanna say Inuit. And so that is basically kind of the three distinct designated groups within Canada of indigenous people. And so now we get into the history and background. Indian Act. Who here has heard of this document? Anybody want to tell me what it is? Louis Riel. Louis Riel. He's made tea, so not quite. The, the reserves come out of the Indian Act for sure. Very good, yeah, that's a really good way to put it. So the Indian Act is a legal document that is used to this day. It was written, I believe, in 1876. Um, it is the legal document that is used to this day to govern the indigenous people of this land. It is a separate set of governing structures. Some might call that an apartheid, right? And that's a very strong word to use, but there is a history of historical and systemic racism and subjugation of indigenous people in Canada. Now, the Indian Act is responsible for things like the reserve system, they're responsible for residential school systems. The Indian Act had clauses in it that outlawed our ceremonies, outlined, outlawed our regalia. We couldn't wear our traditional garb without permission from the Indian agent. In, within the Indian Act, there was something called a res pass. So you had to have permission from the Indian agent to leave the reserve, right? There was also things within the Indian Act, for example, that if a community or municipality were expanding close to a First Nations community, well, that they could pick up that 
First Nations community and relocate it so that they didn't have to absorb them into the municipality. The Indian Act had pieces in it whereby Plains First Nations people could not sell their agricultural wares without specific permission from the Indian agent and they weren't allowed to sell them at market value. All of these things were in this document. The Indian Act removed status from Aboriginal women who married non-Native men, so on and so, and granted status to non-Native women who married Aboriginal men. The Indian Act trumps provincial law when it comes to common law and who gets housing and who cares for children. All of that stuff is written in this document, and it's still called the Indian Act. And this is still being used today. This is still how we're governed. This is us as Indians within Canada, because that's how I'm legally classified, still holds, are still held accountable to this document. And we have something called the Minister of Indigenous Affairs Canada, who's one person, it's Carolyn Bennett, and this person has veto power in all the ongoing things that happen within Indigenous communities. So there are 634 First Nations Indigenous communities across Canada, 634 towns and municipalities, if you will, and this individual has veto power in every single one of those communities when things get done or said. Could you imagine having to know the ins and outs of four, 634 towns and having all of that power to do that? The Indian Act has dictated our chief in council systems, so we are no longer allowed to use hereditary chiefs and traditional systems of government, but we have a band in council, a chief in council with two-year election cycles. All of that is documented within the Indian Act, and all of that is still today functioned. So you can understand us as indigenous people do not like the Indian Act. But what do you do? How do you fix it? The Indian Act affirms our treaty rights. The, in, the Indian Act makes us citizens plus, acknowledges our unique status as, in, as First Nations and Indigenous people in Canada. But it also has all of that. Think about the spirit of the Indian Act and when it was written in 1876. Do you think they really cared for the well-being and the advancement of us as First Nations and Indigenous people? Well, no. But what do we do? I don't know the answer. If you guys know how to solve this, please give me notes. I'd really appreciate it. And out of it came residential schools. How many here have heard of residential schools? How many here do not know what residential schools are? Residential schools, to give you Cole's notes, was law, it was an assimilation practice that lasted well over 100 years, where indigenous kids, by law, had to go away to boarding schools, where they had their language, their culture, everything about them was taken away. Now, my father, right here, so this is me and my dad, I got married this summer, he married us, it was really lovely, he went to residential school. He went to the Shubenacadie Residential School in Nova Scotia. He was five years old when he went in. He was five years old. And he only spoke Mi'kmaq. He didn't speak any English. He, you know, he was born in a bathtub on reserve. You know, he, he still doesn't have a proper birth certificate. And so he was five years old when he went into the residential school. And he doesn't speak Mi'kmaq anymore. He left when he was 10, only speaking English. And not even good English, but afraid to speak Mi'kmaq. And he doesn't remember any words today. And so the moment, and I asked him for permission. I said, can I share this story when I, when I speak? And he says, yes. He says it's important for people to know. There was a moment when he was in residential school when he decided, made the decision as a child that he was no longer going to speak the only language he ever knew. And so and that was when he was a kid. So can you imagine, five years old, six years old, you're a little kid and you're, you're frustrated, you're scared, you're away from your parents and you're speaking to somebody in the only language that you know. And he got caught. Two of the nuns caught him speaking Megum. So they took him up to the priest's office who ran the school, who was in charge of the school. And what they did was they took off his shirt and they turned him around and they held him, his arms. And then the priest took a, a scalpel blade and cut down his back, all the way down his back. He was a kid, he was five, six years old. Could you imagine if you have children, if you have siblings, little cousins, nieces and nephews, could you imagine somebody doing that to a child? But they believed that they were civilizing them. 
And so Daniel Paul, who's an Mi'kmaq historian, academic, wrote a book and said, we were not the savages. Because when you think of those acts and the belief of civilization, who were the savages? Now there was something that just wrapped. It's called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Have any of you heard about the, tr the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? We have not heard of what the TRC is. It's a lot of people. The TRC came out of residential schools. It was Canada's attempt to reconcile what was done. Tens of thousands of children, generations after generations after generations, went to these schools. They, it was part within the RCMP's mandate to round up kids for residential school, because if you didn't send your kids to residential school, the police would come in and take your kids and bring them to the residential school. Now, the TRC attempted to make right. They hosted symposiums where survivors got to come and speak and tell their stories. Many survivors only spoke for the first time at these symposiums, because in these schools, there was this notion of, if you speak up, if you tell your parents, if you say what is going on, something bad will happen. And that persisted through our communities. They call them the lost generations of children, right? And so the TRC have recommendations, have calls to action. But part of that was you know, a class action lawsuit where survivors got common compensation for their experience. It was called a common experience payment. And it was an algorithm, it was a formula that you would pump in, how old were you when you went to residential school? How long were you there? What sort of abuses that you suffered? Some abuses received higher payouts than others, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it would run through this formula and it would pop out a dollar amount on the other end. So my father got a check. He got a check, it was more than 12,000, less than 20. And now my father wasn't in my life growing up. He struggled with alcohol. He was, um, had PTSD. He wasn't around. He was dealing with the traumas that he suffered in residential school. He, he couldn't cope. Now, he got his common experience payment check just as he got sober for the final time. My dad's 15 years sober now. We're very, very proud of him. But he said to me, if you had given me that check while I was still drinking, it would be gone spend it on booze, right? And it took him over a year to cash it. He walked around with a check for thousands of dollars and he couldn't cash it. Because in his mind, his language, his connection to his community, because he couldn't go back, he was so culturally fractured, he couldn't go back. Um, his connection to his elders, to his mother, to his children, right, because he wasn't around, was worth more than 12,000, but less than 20. And by cashing that, it meant that him and Canada were even. And the issue with things like official reconciliation is where, what's, where's your responsibility as the individual? Oh, the TRC, it's official, it's doing it, it's wrapped up. The TRC has wrapped up. We are officially reconciled. But if that were the case, you would know what the TRC was, you would know about residential schools, you would, you know, not judge us, right? And so with that, I have a poem. As a nation, we have missed our mark by one hell of a mile. For the history that defiled my father's culture when he was just a child, to the society that exotifies our braided hairstyles, to the public that buries their heads in the sand piles, whose finger pointing reviles our chiefs and beliefs can <sighs> breathe easy. Because as of 2015, we are officially reconciled which means we're no longer judged. And a Dakota child won't be sent home for the fact that he smudged because he found his brother cold when touched. And there is no grudge against the fact that sometimes I get tax-free gas. But only in pre-approved monitored amounts I wouldn't want to be brash with the spending of my government given cash. We have accepted the norm of more natives in prison, unable to forgive them for the traumas they've suffered, content to maintain a buffer between reality and comfort. Our biased history spun to finally deal with the indigenous conundrum. I can't help but wonder what life was like back in 1491. And we've come to terms 
with the panic in my father's eyes when he reads the apology of lies, his sobriety uncompromised, taking time to exercise the demons that swirl in his soul, the one that was saved and placed into the hole left by the loss of his language. But at least he's got $3,000 in education credits to sandwich his time in lieu between now and the years he spent in residential school. Dad, I have been practicing Gesalu. I'm sorry if this reference is so tensile. I'm working my way through the stages of grief still caught in denial that I nearly forgot. We are reconciled. The highway of tears, girl, that was so last year. No need to fear that you'll be snatched or attacked because it's a fact. We are reconciled. Be so bold as to make a suggestion instead of a budget and a timeline for reconciliation. How about an accurate portrayal of history in our nation's education? Bring back the National Aboriginal Health Organization. Institute classes for language reclamation. Question why there are so many Aboriginals in incarceration or at least develop a strategy for suicide prevention because we kill ourselves up to 11 times more often. And if we had one, Dakota kids wouldn't have to see their little brothers in coffins or to soften the lines in the sand. We all tend to draw and eliminate common words like redskin and squaw. I've washed my hands of this so many times that they're raw, but I can't shake the frustration that we are still referred to as Indians under the law. But worry not, take off my shoes, no need to walk that mile. Because Canada has spent enough money, checked all the right boxes, all of our accounts have been compiled, our perks and benefits beguiled. Congratulations, Canada, you've finally reconciled this nation's state of mind so that in the face of our suffering, you will always turn a blind eye. So it took until the 2000s for a lawsuit for Canada to, pro to progress through um, and to be able to address and deal with these indigenous kind of issues and class action lawsuits for residential school. And that's because that there were laws on the books within the Indian Act that prevented it from happening. So these were some of the laws that were on the book, books. So somebody, you could not sue Canada because residential school was law. So they said, okay, well maybe we should protect ourselves in case people don't like this and want to sue us. So it was law that you could not sue the government of Canada on behalf of an Indian, because that was the language being used at the time, without explicit permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs. So you can s probably guess that nobody ever sued Canada during that time. And well, maybe they weren't gonna sue them, but wanted legal advice on what to do next, right? Well, th they made another law saying that as a lawyer, you could not offer any kind of advice to an indigenous person on suing the government of Canada without explicit permission from the Indian agent or else that lawyer would be immediately disbarred and could face prosecution as well as the, the Indian at the time, right? And but well, maybe we're frustrated and we wanna talk about what's going on and we wanna just get together. Well, groupings of three or more Indians couldn't get together and discuss policy and law without being guilty of an Indian conspiracy and could also face prosecution and jail time. Those were laws within Canada. So when I talk about systemic racism and oppression and silencing of indigenous voice, these were just some of them. And then in 1891, prior to what people think, native people could vote, you know, only men could vote during that time. And you had to be 21 years old and you could, you know, if you owned land worth 100 pounds or about $150 off reserve, you had the right to vote. And so at one point in time, before this was enacted, a group of Mohawk, First Nations people got together and voted out a conservative MP. And so then they created, well, we don't want that to happen again. So they created the Indian Advancement Law, where they said that only persons could vote in Canada. And when they made the definition of persons, they didn't include First Nations people. So they stripped personhood from Indians. And we didn't become persons again until 1960. That was when we became persons once more under the law. My father was 17 years old before he was considered a person. And so these are some of the laws that were in Canada that still exist on the books today. And even though they're not, you're not used, a lot of this is pre-Confederation too, or you know, those sorts of things that set precedent. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that sort of stuff that existed in Halifax a little later as I go through. But you can tell when people are like, why are you so mad? Why are Native people so angry? And I just say things like this, right?
Ha ha. Status cards. The holy grail of benefits. Right? Really? Maybe. Is there anything funny about this? Have a look. What do you notice? What do you notice about this card? Yeah. Pardon? Animals on it? Yep. What else? Yeah, so there's that too. It's a certificate of Indian status. What else? I'll give you a hint. There's an expiration date. Can everyone here who's not indigenous pull out their cards, their eth ethnicity cards that expires? How many of you have your legal ethnicities expire every 10 years? And with it, access to your rights? Because I do. Every 10 years, my ethnicity expires, and along with it, my treaty rights. That's a good point, right? So here's the thing. You only have access to treaty rights if you have one of these cards, right? Now, Absolutely, but you don't have a limit to that. So you can, you can apply, you can get it back, you can do all those sorts of things, but you don't have someone saying, well, you're not sick enough to get one of those cards. So this is a legal classification. This limits access to treaty rights. So remember when I said non-status, that there's the title non-status Indian in Canada. So status has nothing to do with blood quantum. It has nothing to do with culture. It has nothing to do with language. We don't get to determine who and who is not a status Indian in Canada. It's, it's regulated, regulated through the Indian Act. And so there is something called six ones and six twos. So prior to 1985, Native women who married non-Native men lost their status and all of the benefits and rights that go along with it. Their right to live in community, their right for treaty rights, all of those sorts of things, gone. Their children and their children's children lost that. Now here's the thing. If it's flipped, Native men who married non-Native women, well, those women gain status. So those women became full status Indians within Canada, even though they were not an indigenous person. So my mother is non-native, but she married my father in 1981, and she became full status Indian within Canada. And because of that, I am a 6-1 in my status classification, which means that I can pass status on to my children. If my parents' ethnicities were reversed, my mom would have lost her status, I would not have status. My mom could apply for it back, but then I would become a 6'2 and not be able to pass status on to my kids. That makes, like, you can see why it's very frustrating because you only get access to rights if you're status. So all of those non-status people who lost their status don't have access to their rights. They could be living in community, they could be language carriers, they could be elders, they could be prominent members within our own indigenous world, but they don't get recognized legally by Canada, by the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, by the Prime Minister as a status Indian within Canada. So you can tell, can you tell me how these are a good idea? Because all they do is limit and control who has access to treaty rights. And so it is, predict it is predicted, it's an arithmetic, how is it, arithmetic assimilation. That within 30 years, there will be no status Indians left in Canada. And if there are no status Indians left in Canada, there is no obligation to uphold treaty. Because one side, the legal designation side, no longer exists. And without that legal designation, Canada doesn't have a responsibility. And so when you hear about duty to consult and pipelines and you know, all of those sorts of things and a lot of the indigenous people who stand up for those issues, it's, it's because of treaty that they have the right to do that. But if treaty is dissolved because there are no legal people 
Who can do that? Well, then Canada has a lot easier job when it comes to doing a lot of things that they want to do. And so, I got a poem. So I do a lot of poetry, as you can tell. Um, I compete nationally, and most of my poetry is indigenously related. And I had a person say to me, they gave me advice, advice. They said, you know, you, you might want to diversify the type of poetry that you do. You, you wouldn't want to be pigeonholed as the native poet. I was like, oh, buddy. <laughs> be sure to diversify your pieces. You wouldn't want to be pigeonholed as the native poet. So it was said to me and me to myself in my constant self-doubt that my passion for my people would fall on deaf ears and rolled eyes, the following, a taste of why I will never give in on hustling my allies. Every word is something I've witnessed, read, or heard. So I ask that you listen before you tell me what I say is absurd. Here we go again, they'll say to themselves. She's probably going to talk about water quality and mental health, 20 years of boil orders and contaminated wells, or 140 attempts in two weeks to kill themselves. But if you live on reserve, chief and council will give you a free house, so it can't be that bad, though we took status away from your spouse. As a tax-paying citizen, my favorite line ever, as a tax-paying citizen, I don't believe we should continue to support them. So what if we spend $4,000 less each year on every one of their children? Children. It's because the young and white are the new post-secondary victim. Affirmative action and designated seats are taking away opportunity from the country's elite. I worked hard to get where I am with no help from charity. Achievements should be based purely on a meritocracy. Because the halls were full of people who looked like me, I must have been outstanding to earn my degree. I have never ever been given something for free and I can't even express my opinions on the CBC because everybody is too concerned with being PC. So you can see why my frustration can push me to the other side of angry. History's voice is color-coded by those who have always had the right to vote for it. Do you know what it's like to only see yourself as appropriated, to see Carly Kloss wearing a headdress on the runway half naked, being told that spray-painted racial slurs on homes in Nova Scotia are isolated? Your ignorance is showing if you think colonialism is over and outdated by the egregious fact that I need a government-issued card that proves that I'm native, a card requiring birth certificates, photographs, and guarantors to be validated a car that expires every 10 years. Point me to a colonizer whose ethnicity can be held in arrears. I would like to read the Federal White Act. I'd like to see your equivalent to e-tags and a res pass. Maybe live in a city founded by a man who put a bounty on your scalps on the corner of Cornwallis Street is where our friendship center is housed. Did you ever stop and think why we are called the Redskins? It's because we've spent generations trying to scrub off the moniker of Dirty Indian. Trudeau is great and all, but I am still five times more likely to go missing. Justin, that Haida tattoo is cute, but we've got to sit down and listen. It's time to get this country in a treaty condition. And y'all can suck your teeth and roll your eyes because I am simply not ready to diversify my writing to go with it. Because I am proud to be pigeonholed as the native poet. This is one of my favorite slides of my presentation. So the way in which indigenous people are viewed, it gets perpetuated into normalcy, right? It's, you know, when you think of people who dress up as an Indian, well, blackface is horrible and terribly racist, but yet you can dress up in red face. And oh, I'm, I don't mean to offend, I'm, I'm trying to honor you. I just love your culture so much. And it gets perpetuated. So I'm seeing, okay, well, you've got a headdress, which is like Plains Ojibwe, and maybe the fringe you're wearing, well, that's Hopi Navajo. And the moccasins, well, those are, those are Mi'kmaq moccasins. And so we are so diverse. There are over 50 languages, you know, very, like, we're so, so, so diverse. And to see it be lumped together and be like, ah, leather, feathers. Let me guess, you're an Indian, huh, right? And so, why is this normal? Hey, oh, right? Chief Wahoo of the Cleveland Indians. 
I don't match that color, but all right, okay, cool. That's what we look like. So why is, is this normal? But this, all of a sudden, well, that's insensitive, that's rude, that's reverse racism. I don't understand. And a lot of this gets, you know, done under the guise that, well, we're honoring you. Or no, this is vintage. It's been that way forever. We don't intend to upset you. Well, that's the thing about intentions. Just because you intend it doesn't mean that it's not received that way. And the example that I like to give, if it's hot, it's summertime, I'm walking down Spring Garden Road in Halifax and I'm wearing shorts and a tank top. And somebody yells out their car and whistles and says, smile, baby, you look beautiful. He might not intend to make me feel unsafe. It doesn't change the fact that that's how I feel. So it's not on the victim to prove why they are victimized. But it's more about the person who is doing the oppressing to recognize that their behavior has consequence. And one of my favorite quotes, it's from a Huffington Post article, and it says, when you are so used, when you are so used to everyone getting out of your way for you, equality can start to feel a lot like oppression. And so I wrote a poem, it's called I Am Honored. If you like sports, I'm really sorry. My name is Swift Fox, proud member of the Mi'kmaq Nation of Mi'kma'ki, the Wabanaki people of the dawn with a legacy 12,000 years long, and I am honored. I am honored with overpriced beer and shitty hot dogs, by juiced up ball players and abusive running backs, by packs of fans packed into stands doing the tomahawk chop. In 2013, a Philadelphia Eagles fan was photographed, impaled on his staff, crass and crude, was the mocked up head of an indigenous man, and I was honored. In his grasp, a perfect portrayal of postmodern cultural appropriation and genocide, the public perception made perfectly clear the head of a dead Indian in one hand, and in the other, a beer. Daughter of a survivor and keeper of my family's culture, I listen to my elders, I know my teachings, my beliefs, I stand tall against the culture thieves, yet time and time again, I am told our leadership is not being disrespected by the KC chiefs because I am honored. We are caricatures, mascots to amuse you like the realest Indian on the block, Chief Wahoo, ancient mythical creatures entombed in lieu of respect, our confidence wrecked by bisected public scrutiny between judgment of too much sensitivity and contempt for perceived easy corruptibility, and so I am honored. I'm saving my favorite for last the epitome of my righteous indigenous wrath, the Washington professional football team, whose name is the IV morphine to the politically correct, beaten and battered, ignorant majority. A team name that is such an obvious racial slur, a team name that you'll have to concur is literally colorblind. Because when it's all done and said, I'm really more brown than I have ever been red. A team name that alienates, isolates, racially perpetuates our inferior status. A team name whose trademark no longer has a basis because even American copyright officers know that it's racist. A team name that will never cross these lips or cross my cutting tongue unless it's to cut its supporters down by several rungs because I am honored. I am honored by the eagle feather that was given to me upon the completion of my master's degree. I am honored by the hysterical laughter of my nephew sitting on my knee. I am honored by my father's 15 years of sobriety for a national inquiry and the right to marry a non-native man without the world questioning my indigeneity, but I am just one person, so. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. I want my cultural pride back, but the world won't cut me some slack and it's rigged, rigged, rigged for the home team. Somehow we're always to blame because it's privilege that makes all the rules in the honor game. Oh man, Johnny Depp, hate that guy, hate that guy so much. Um, 
That concept of red face, right? Dressing up as an Indian. You know, this is in Tonto. They had Rooney Mara play Tiger Lily in Pan. You see all the time that they cast non-Indigenous actors to play Indigenous parts, right? And when that gets normalized and perpetuated within the media, it has a significant lived experience backlash. So does anybody know who these folks are down here? Yeah? Yeah? A Tribe Called Red. A Tribe Called Red, they're indigenous, like house music, EDM, they're fantastic. They take powwow beats um, and songs and they remix them. Lovely, wonderful, and they're such nice guys too. They're really, really nice guys. And so they came to Halifax and they did a show and so I went to the show, a lot of the Indigi folks came out to do a show in Halifax. Um, and there were these three people who had war paint on their faces, not Indigenous people to the, at the concert. And if you read any of their articles or interviews, they say, don't dress up as an Indian for our, co like our concerts. Please don't, you're making fun of us. We will stop the music and point you out. Do not do it. And so I was with a friend of mine and I said, you know, Dylan, would you mind coming with me? And I just want to kind of say to these people, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing that. And so we went up to them and I tapped them on the shoulder and I said, excuse me, I, I don't know if you're aware, but what you have on your face is really not cool. It's, it's actually quite offensive. Um, and we'd really appreciate it if you were to wash it off. And so I was expecting two reactions, right? One of two reactions. The first reaction would be, whatever. And then they would ignore us. Okay, cool. The second reaction was the one I was really hoping for was, oh, like, yeah, we didn't know. Sorry, like, yeah, no worries or whatever. Sure, we'll wash it off. And I'll be great, awesome, let me buy you a beer, drink, whatever. Great, learning, teachable moment. What I wasn't expecting was the third reaction. And it was the outright aggression and the right that they had to wear war paint on their face. And when I asked them to do it, they said, who are you? Show me your status card and they demanded to see my status card because apparently I had to be a card-carrying Indian within the meaning of the Indian Act, chapter 27, section 35 of the Constitution to call them out on their racist behavior. And so I was getting all riled up and my friend Devin, who was much more calm, he said, sorry, Dylan, Dylan says, no, no, like, let's just go. They're not gonna do it, let's just go, that's fine. And so I wrote a Facebook status and I said, you know, to the non-native folks who picked a fight with the Mi'kmaq and Métis people who asked you to wash off your war paint, you just earned yourself a poem. Sincerely, Halifax's first Indigenous Poet Laureate. You don't know who you're messing with. <laughs> and so, at the end of the show, I pull out my phone, and the, my status had been shared like 50, 60 times. I was like, whoa. And I started getting a bunch of tweets, and I was like, whoa. And then the CBC called me, and they said, hey, we want to have you on. Did you write that poem yet? And I was like... Damn it, I gotta write that poem. So I wrote the poem. Um, and right now, if you Google that poem, it has close to 200,000 shares. You know, because again, it was like, yeah, are you serious? Like, I can't believe this is, I can't believe I have to do this. Um, and so anyway, it turned into this, this kind of big, big ordeal. And so I have, I have the poem and I'll, and I'll read you the poem because you seem to like that stuff. All right, I've got a good one. Johnny Depp, Rooney Mara, and a Cleveland Indians fan walk into a bar. I'm just kidding. It's not funny. Red face. Let's just call it misplaced cultural appreciation instead of blatantly obvious racism. Criticisms of sensitivity are so severe. I have decided to turn it on its ear this year for Halloween. Wait for it. It's going to score some serious points on the party scene. I'm going to honor my ancestry and go as my great-great-grandmother, a genuine, full-blooded Caucasian princess, but not to excess. Just a tasteful amount of Starbucks pumpkin spice, messy top knot, and Navajo urban outfitters dress. I've accessorized it with Coachella tickets, but no headdress. I know that's racist. I read Huffington Post in excess. Are you offended yet? Let's make things all better with a Twitter apology, class pans emoji, and the hashtag blessed. 
By now, I bet you're pissed and you should be. What I did wasn't cool, so let me school you on your misplaced anger at the frustrated native instead of the war paint wearer. See, we lived through centuries of genocidal terror, catastrophic errors from simply being born brown and the legacy of the crown. You, you doubled down on your privilege when you demanded to see our cards inflicted and reopened generations of scars because you were called out for your racist garb of colors on your face. Even poor taste given the main act on stage. Do you think that a tribe called Red or just a couple of Indians in a phase on some sort of display? The few who broke free of the colonial cage? Can you see why I'm enraged? It's a shame that you chose the poet laureate to engage because I don't pull punches when I play this game. Our women go missing. Our men are shot and killed because they sought help for a tires de-rimming. Go fund me pages, paint the shooter as the victim. His story prioritized when accounts are conflicting. Did you know that we've never had an Ilnu hold the INAC minister's position? On the inside, my war paint is dripping, pooling into my spirit. I'm sipping the fire. I am the physical embodiment to contrast the native inspired. I will not tread lightly. I came fight to see. I came armed to fight you, see, two degrees and enough community backing. I will line up my brothers and sisters and send you packing because we are done with your attacking. This is Turtle Island. After centuries of being repressed, you owe us a debt. You can go wash your face now and pay us your respects. And in keeping with the theme of silence of the symposium, you see how we honor, we honor genocide. We honor histories of genocide. So this, this guy right here, this is Edward Cornwallis. He is the founder of Halifax, regardless of the fact that Halifax is also Jabuktuk and has been there for millennia. He founded the garrison town of Halifax. I chose this picture specifically because on his shoulder, my husband is a birder. He's an, you know, he's an ornithologist, he's a big nerd. Um, that's a European starling and it is an incredibly evasive species that has um, outcompeted and pushed out many of the indigenous cavity nesters. So I thought that was really fantastic to see, in my opinion, an invasive species perched on the shoulder of an invasive species. <laughs> now, Cornwallis, what he did is he issued a scalping proclamation on Mi'kmaq men, women, and children that you could bring in a scalp and you would be paid a certain amount of pounds for that scalp. Um, they did it because the Mi'kmaq people were so good at holding down their lands and defending our territory that the settlers and, and the, the people from the British Army were actually, they, they didn't want to leave the bases, they wouldn't want to leave you know, Citadel Hill because they would go and they'd disappear. And so he issued the scalping proclamation. That scalping proclamation is still on the books today in Nova Scotia. It's null and void, but it's still there. It's still legally on the books. And so we have a statue of Edward Cornwallis in downtown Halifax in Cornwallis Park. And he's on this big pedestal and you walk in and they have a little plaque that says, Edward Cornwallis is the founder of Nova Scotia, or sorry, founder of Halifax. They don't mention the scalping proclamation at all. And so this spring, the city council had a vote. Let's have a conversation about how we honor Cornwallis. Not take down the street signs, not tear down the statue. Let's have a conversation. Let's vote to have a conversation. And that motion did not pass. They did not want to have that conversation. And so I start furiously tweeting at the CBC, and my friends start tweeting it and say, have me on, have me on, I'm Halifax's poet laureate, I'm the first indigenous poet laureate, have me on, have me on, have me on. And a lot of the justification for that was that, you know, this is the deputy mayor at the time, Matt Whitman, said, well, I think at the end of the day, when we really look into Cornwallis, well, we're going to find out that he wasn't perfect. That was the justification. He wasn't perfect, right? And so they had me on CBC radio, and we had debate at one of the counselors, you know, and he said, you know, we should bring him into a more prominent place. We should rename the ferry lane, Cornwallis ferry lane, da 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 da. And to the very end, um, the interviewer said, Rebecca, as poet laureate, you know, are you going to write a poem? And you could hear, you can hear it on the, the radio recording. You can hear, ask me, ask me what I'm going to name it. Ask me what I'm going to name the poem. <laughs> Not perfect. So here we go. I don't 
don't shower every day. I'm not perfect. I sing off key when I drive on the highway. I'm not perfect. I have a dedicated husband, but still fall in love every day. But hey, I'm not perfect. There are a lot of things I can forgive and understand as human error, but not a single one of those comes in the form of inciting racialized terror. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the lack of perfection is a poor excuse to keep Cornwallis enshrined regardless of his abuse. Please cut him loose. Do you get what I'm saying? Or are my arguments obtuse? How can granting us our humanity be any less of a priority than making the donaire the official meal of Halifax City? It's a pity that late night drunk foods get to be classified as today's most current issues. Where are our statues? May I suggest a few? Anime Aquash, Donald Marshall Jr. or Grand Chief Member 2 C, they all meet the criteria of not being perfect. They're a group of real apple tree serpents. Anime, a divorcee. Member two and Marshall, a rebel Catholic and a criminal. Maybe that last one ended in acquittal, but it's because the world thought an ill news words were too brittle to be believed. And it's not news to me. We have already whitewashed our streets to rinse off our red stained hands and feet. In that park, all paths lead to his bronzed greed. I beg and plead, can't you see what I see? That a man decreed a proclamation on our scalps. I'm taking you to task. I'm asking for your help to heal generations of spiritual welts because we were seen as animals only valued for our pelts. And today, we are members of your community. Show us your humility. Take my extended branch in unity and stop honoring a man who prided himself on his limitless brutality, who counted Mi'kmaq fatalities. Our skins were used as currency. His legacy built on the belief that our vagrancy justified replacing our only home Mi'kmaqi with a British colony hell bent on extinguishing our existence. But we are persistent. Centuries later, we are still mounting a resistance because no amount of hubris can strip us of our resilience. We are still here. I can't make that any more clear. Don't fear a rewriting of the past, but rather how it looks when this is recorded in the history books. When you turned a blind eye and spied the easy way out, when you flexed your privileged clout in a bout with a predetermined outcome because there is nobody in that room who looks differently than you to challenge the status quo, the same old, same old, is this how Halifax chooses to be bold? Did you know that the West looked to the East on how to rid themselves of the indigenous beast. They looked to this coast to justify killing kids. They said, all lice grows from nits. And if even only a fraction of that were true, is this the legacy that you wanna have immortalized in a statue? And did you wanna be the one to explain this to my nieces and my nephews? It's time for your minds to be changed and pride to be checked. It's time that our voices are given a lot more respect. I will not fault you for a change of heart on the subject. Together we can find a comp compromise and work it because at the end of the day, I recognize how hard it is to be perfect. And so know your bias and with it, your limits. So I came in today, my hair's in braids. I'm wearing my beaded earrings. I am maybe what you would expect when you see an indigenous person, right? And maybe you take what I say a little bit more serious because of how I'm dressed. So as we go, you're learning about indigenous issues and indigenous people. And I hear a lot, right? Well, you don't necessarily look that native. Or would you think of an indigenous person? Would you see us with curly hair? Maybe blue eyes. Right? And understanding that maybe you listen to me because I fit the stereotype of what you think I should look like as an indigenous person. So, when I take out my braids and when I take off my jewelry and I put my hair up into a ponytail, do I still meet your expectations of what an indigenous activist looks like? Do I? Or did you listen to me more earnestly before than had I come out like this in the first place? This is how indigenous people make the news. This is the formula. And the media is so, so important in shaping indigenous perspectives in the public eye. 
WD4, it's the formula. One W, four Ds. We make the news if we're warriors. This is the Oka crisis, right? This picture should be very, very famous to many of you. We're warriors, we're standing up for something. We make the news for that. Now the Ds, we make the news when we meet your expectations of exoticism. Dancing. Drumming. Or we make the news when we fulfill the stereotypes of being a burden on society. We're drunk. Or we're dead. Does anybody know who this young man is? This is Colton Bushi. I referenced him in, in my poem, Red Face, when I talked about our men who are shot and killed who sought help for a tires de-rimming. He's from Saskatchewan. And him and his friends and his girlfriend were out um, at the river, at the lake, swimming, having a good time. And when they were on their way home, they blew a tire. And so they pulled off into the driveway of a farmer's driveway. And you know, accounts are conflicting, but regardless of what the accounts were, he did not deserve what happened to him. And that was the farmer came down and shot a shotgun into the car and killed him. And the farmer said, I feared for my life as justification. This is how we make the news. Can you think of positive indigenous stories? Can you think of them? But when you think of indigenous stories right now, you think of the suicide crises that are happening up north. You hear about missing and murdered indigenous women. You hear about protests, standing rock, right? Again, warriors who were dead, who were missing. Right? This is how you see us. And yes, it is important to cover these issues, but you have to cover more than that. How many of you, knew, of you know that Ashley Collingbull was the first indigenous Mrs. Universe, right? and that she used traditional jingle dress dance as her um, talent portion of the competition? Or the fact that the Mi'kmaq language is going to actually survive and is beginning to thrive because of the immersion indigenous or language um, elementary schools that are happening, or the amount of indigenous graduates that are graduating. We have more people graduating with MDs, PhDs, and law degrees than we've ever had before. How many of you guys know that? But how many of you are so familiar with these narratives, right? So then you wonder why we're insular, you wonder why we protect ourselves. And it's because if this is all you know, we don't want to have a conversation with you. And so this is a really good example. So a few years ago, there was the New Brunswick anti-fracking protest. So um, SWN was coming and doing seismic testing around El Siboktuk First Nations. Um, and they said, well, how is this going to affect the water table? Right? We're really concerned about that. And there were two images that circulated through my media feeds. One was this one, the burned out cop cars. This was on CBC, this is on CTV, this is on Global, this is what circulated on news feeds over and over and over and over again. Now, the next image was shot by Ozzy Michelin from the Aboriginal People's Television Network, and this is what circulated because the woman who's in this is a friend of mine, and this is what circulated through my Facebook, through my Twitter, and through the indigenous news outlets. It is a very, very different narrative, but it is the same story, right? And so, this is what people see, the majority of what people see. This is what I see, right? This woman was dragged by the advancing RCMP. She was praying peacefully on her own territory with a sacred eagle feather, and she was dragged and handcuffed off scene. But this is what gets shown, right? Rowdy Indians causing a stir. And Standing Rock, when it comes to silencing, Right? You hear all about Standing Rock, all about Standing Rock, I stand with Standing Rock. But then when we come to silencing, people want to jump on these things because they think it's really great. But there was so much merchandise that were being sold that people were taking advantage of an indigenous struggle and pocketing the money. So all those t-shirts that say, I stand with Standing Rock, are you sure that that money is going towards Standing Rock? Or do you just want to be part of a movement because at that time, being indigenous and being into that is neat, right? How many of you guys learned about Native people in elementary school? What did you learn? Did you learn about language? Did you learn about treaty? Did you learn about whose territory you're in? I didn't learn any of that. We had an exercise at Thanksgiving where I got to cut out 
feathers, construction paper feathers, and glue them to a headband and wear them on my head. And that was the extent that I learned about indigenous issues. I didn't hear the word Mi'kmaq, I only heard Mi'kmaq. I only heard the word Mi'kmaq when I was in university. Because much of the current state, right, is what gets taught and how it gets taught. And if you grow up knowing one set of fundamental truths and then in your adulthood someone like me comes around and goes, mm, that's not right, well then you might say, well no, that's all I've ever known. I learned it from my mom, I learned it from my teacher, they're awesome people, da da da. And I say, well that's racist. I'm not saying that they're racist, but I'm saying the narrative is racist. That can cause people to get really defensive, right? So I love this, Native Americans discovered Columbus. Right? Because how can you discover a continent that's been here for millennia that people have been living in for thousands of years? How can that be discovered? Right? And this is one of my favorite, the Aboriginal voice. So I'm here speaking about indigenous stuff, but I am one person, one person with one story who grew up off reserve, who doesn't speak her language, who is Mi'kmaq. I can't possibly speak on behalf of all indigenous people. I can give you perspective, I can give you things that resonate, that you might find solidarity and common threads throughout, but I am certainly not the expert on this. So I always like to, I'm not going to pick on anyone individually, but for someone here who is of European descent, can you explain to me all of the intricate details and fallout from the Brexit in the European Union and how that's going to affect international trade? No? Some European descent person, you are. Give us a break. You can't expect a person to know every single thing with regards to indigenous issues. We are still learning our own histories. And yeah, they might be conflicting, and yes, we might mess up, but you don't have a right to hold us to perfection, right? And so, I love this. It must be pretty cool. And I say this a lot tongue-in-cheek, so. It must be cool to be white and just represent yourself and not your entire racial group. Because it's true. I come up here, I feel very, very pressured that I am representing all indigenous people in Canada. But it's not true. I'm just representing myself. And murdered and missing indigenous women. So this one hits home for me because I am this demographic, right? I am under 31 years old and you know we make up 10% of female homicides but we as indigenous people only make up 3% of the population which means that 1.5% of the population is indigenous people so why are we killed almost 10 times more often? Why do we go missing so much, right? Tina Fontaine, does anyone know this story? Has anyone heard of Tina Fontaine? Remember when I said the media likes to only cover certain things? Well, when an indigenous person goes missing, when an indigenous woman goes missing, they tend to add in all these extra little details. Tina Fontaine was a 15-year-old girl. She was in foster care, and she ran away, and she died. Now, her body was pulled to the Red River. It was wrapped in plastic. The media said that, well, you know, she was at risk, and she worked in the sex industry, and she had issues with drugs. How is that going to help me find her? It's not. But what it does is this almost permission to the public. You don't have to care as much. Because you know what? She might have brought it on herself. Loretta Saunders from Halifax. She died in 2014. Now, she doesn't look visibly indigenous, but she's Inuk from Labrador. Her mother is quoted saying, I hope they don't find out that she's native because they'll keep looking for her if that's the case. And that's what happened. The world fell in love with Loretta Saunders before they found out that she was indigenous. And when they found out she was indigenous, the next article published at the very end said, and she's recovering from a crack addiction. That was never mentioned before, but when it came out that she was Inuk, somehow that little bit of information now became pertinent to her story as a missing and murdered indigenous woman. This is Tanya Brooks, she's Megama as well. She was found in a window well in a school. And the majority of the article talked about her involvement in the sex trade. Before it talked about where she was from, before it talked about her family, before it talked about any of that. They needed to set the stage that, you know what? Maybe she asked for it. And this is how we get portrayed. 
and it has a lasting legacy and community impact. And so, I know I'm bumming you out, I'll find, I promise I'm, I'll lift you back up by the end. But this is really serious because I am that demographic. I'm an indigenous woman. And our bodies and our styles and our aesthetic gets consumed. How many of you in here own a pair of moccasins or that blocky indigenous style print? How many of you have owned something with fringe on it or feathers? Our aesthetic and our style gets taken, but we as people, for some reason, don't. And so this final poem, not final poem, but here is called Pennies. She slays in those double braids. She is slayed because of those double braids. The original voice silenced from those double braids. They can be bought and sold, those double braids. In fact, there is a sale at the bay for those double braids. Look for the HBC original canoe, for your half-off Canadian branded series of snowshoes. Erase the creators of those goods. Their origin and history have no need to be understood. Use them for your favorite winter activities, like lightly frolicking over her forgotten snow-covered body. It's buy one, get one. Misrepresentations of her story. Just look for the nearest store occupying our territory. Check the back of your status cards for the special pin that includes free judgment to go along with the perceived sin that what she got, she had coming. And if she goes missing, have her family bring in the newspaper clipping for their discounted black suits, dresses, and other dark labels. It's a quality purchase that can be worn over and over as a funeral staple. Given the current societal climate, they'll get plenty of wear out of this product. Like last year's fashion, it's so easy to forget her, just toss her remains in Manitoba's aptly named Red River, and the vitriol comes free with purchase. If she had some form of mental illness, it's a points card full of expert witness that would be remiss if he didn't remind us that she was at risk because she happened to choose to be in the prostitution business. And you'll find the public apathy on the shelf next to the sacred music festival headdresses. For every 10 biased news stories, you'll get a free personal allegory of a guy who knows a guy who dated a native girl because he doesn't see color and is well read, who wants a special gold star because he went to a powwow once and totally listens to a tribe called Red. I would say their names, but there are far too many. We are the forgotten Canadian penny, our coppery skin removed from circulation over time because it isn't as valued as the lighter dime. It's 10 for one, what a deal. Just like our land, we come at a steal. Her body's a commodity bought and sold as prepackaged native spirituality. Sorry, we don't sell an empowered indigenous matriarchy, but we do carry exotified Indians, include it with batteries. Her life's receipt is marked final sale. There are no refunds on colonization retail. It's a Black Friday event with tax exemption. It's our culture turned boho style consumption. Keep beating those drums for social redemption. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get positive media attention. APTN coverage of a sunrise ceremony on a red morning because the red are mourning the double braids found 90% off in the bargain box, but we don't know where they came from because the tags were ripped off. But there's hope. I'm almost done, I promise. There is hope. And so this concept called Eduopta Monk, and it's called two-eyed seeing, and the concept is that there is strengths that exist in a colonized world. Absolutely. You know, the sun never set on the British Empire for a long time because they were very good at what they did, right? The style of learning, the way we are in our classrooms today, that's all European and Eurocentric design. There is strength to that, for sure. But there's also strength to our worldviews. And the concept of two-eyed two seeing exists in that we ask you, non-Indigenous people to see through our perspective at the same time that you see through your perspective. And it's not saying that yours is less than or you should feel guilty or et cetera, et cetera. It's more about saying that, hey, your perspective is valid, but so is ours. And let's acknowledge and work with the fact that there are multiple perspectives at the same time. And that's a good thing. And so the concept of two eyed seeing, I have a poem, but I'm running out of time, so I can't do it about it, but it's more about recognizing that there are many, many different ways to get to an end point, and we've only ever done one. And so with two-eyed seeing, I have a TED talk on it, you can look it up. Um, 
it talks about that, about understanding the different shift in perspective. And so it's really important that you understand or you look at what story or what image, oh, sorry, that you see when you're done. What, what person are you looking at, right? Are you looking at the traditional, you know, dancer, right? The really, the one that you saw walk in here today that you say, hmm, she knows what she's talking about. Look at those braids, look at them, right? Are you telling, you know, is that the person you're looking at or are you looking at the poet, you know? I'm a slam poet, I've done a lot of national competitions, all that sort of stuff. Are you looking at the legacy? So this is my great grandfather, Michael Thomas. He was the best in runner to ever come out of PEI. They have a statue after him. They have a runner, uh, sorry, a run named after him. Are you looking at the protester? Right, the warrior, you know, I march down the streets during Idle No More singing the Miyagama Honor Song. Are you looking at the scholar? I'm the first person in my family to have ever reached the level of education that I, that I have. And because of that, my family is very, very, very proud of me. Are you looking at the drunken party girl? Right, is that what you're looking at, you know? Or are you looking at the person who set history? So I'm the first indigenous poet laureate of Halifax. You might only see one aspect to that. You're seeing the scholar, you're seeing the poet. This is who you're seeing right now, right? But that's not my entire identity. And when you make those snap judgments of an indigenous person because of how they're dressed or because of a story that you read them in or because of this mythical fantasy of what you expect an indigenous person to be like, you're taking those centuries of colonization and you are continuing to use and oppress with those. Whether or not you do, but it happens. And so it's all about being critical. And if you're leaving this talk going, I don't know what to think anymore, I've done my job. And so with that, I say we're all treaty people. Because treaties, two sides, sign those documents. You have a responsibility to us, but we also have a responsibility to you and the land that we share. And so with that, I am all finished. I am done. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you.